this is where we step out of the vacuum that you can breathe. And here, we start talking about what actually happens due to the force of air resistance, the force of drag. Now, these resistive forces are, the force of drag is proportional to the velocity. Have I used that proportional symbol for you before? Okay, and you're both in yeses and noes, which leads me to believe that you're not sure. Uh, this symbol here, alpha, not only means angular acceleration or fishy thing, it also means proportional to. So the drag force is proportional to the velocity. And acceleration is equal to the change in velocity over change in time, right? And the net force is equal to mass times the acceleration. And so you can see that velocity changes the acceleration, the acceleration changes the force, and the force changes the velocity, the velocity changes the acceleration, the acceleration changes the force, the force changes the velocity. There's a whole cyclic thing there that makes it difficult to deal with. And we'll get to how you deal with that piece in a little bit. It's called numerical modeling. We're not quite there. So there are two different equations we have for resistive forces. One is that the resistive force, which is a vector, is equal to negative b times the vector v. And this b is called the, the proportionality constant. And it has dimensions of kilograms per second. Proportionality constant. And this one, this equation is generally true for small objects at small speeds. We also have an equation which is the resistive force is equal to one half, and I'm going to walk through each one of these, capital D rho A V squared. Capital D. It's called the drag coefficient. The drag coefficient. Now, the drag coefficient depends on the shape of the object and the material the object is made of. The drag coefficient has no dimensions. And it, as I said, it's dependent on the shape and the material the object is made of. You can look up all sorts of different drag coefficients on the web if you want. For example, a flat plate has a drag coefficient of approximately 1.28. A bullet, depending on the shape, about 0.295. A sphere, depending on the material, is anywhere from 0.07 to 0.5. Uh, a wing of an airplane, is a, depending on the wing, of course, is about 0.045. So the drag coefficient is really just dependent on the shape and the material of the object. Rho is the density of whatever the object is going through. It's the density of the medium. No, it's not the density of the object itself. It's the density of the medium through which the object is moving. A is called the cross-sectional area. Technically, this is the area of the object which is perpendicular to the velocity of the object. So what, for example, is the cross-sectional area of a sphere class? It's a circle, right? So the cross-sectional area of a sphere is going to be a circle. You could have, ooh, I have little eggs I could talk about. You could see the cross-sectional area of an egg, if it's moving in this direction, is also going to be a circle, right? But if instead I have the object moving this way, the cross-sectional area is actually going to be an oval or an egg shape, more specifically. Right? But if it's going this direction, that cross-sectional area would actually just be a circle. Eggs. Who knew? All right. So the area perpendicular to the velocity. And this last one, this velocity is just the velocity of the object. Now, this one is, I'm just going to say, more generally applicable. There are some times when we will simply approximate it as being equal to the resistive force equal to negative b times the velocity. 
but more often than not, the resistance distance force is going to be equal to one half times the drag coefficient times the density of the medium times the cross-sectional area times the velocity squared. Mr. Palmer, do I have to memorize these equations? No. Anytime you have had to use these equations on an AP test, they are given to you every time that I've seen them over the past 30 or so years. So no, do not memorize them. This will be true for my test and quizzes as well. We will simply give them to you. It's not true of the homework problems, for example, but you could just look it up in the book. So please, do not memorize. There will be plenty for you to memorize. Some of you get overzealous with your memorization. You get really excited. No, stop. There will be plenty. Don't worry. I always get the question too, what's a small object at a small speed? How do I know if it's small or not? Don't you worry, we're gonna get to do a lab where you get to figure some of that out. And we'll tell you, okay? So we'll tell you whether which one to use, basically. That's how it works. Um, let's see, let's walk through just a simple example problem so we can talk about how this works. Oh, actually, before we do so, there's a difference between the two equations. One has a negative in it, and the other one does not. Um, Andrew, what's the difference? Why does one have a negative and one does not? Well, the first equation, r is a vector. Yep, and the second one? It's a magnitude. It's a scalar, so it's just the magnitude. That's correct. So the, the reason one has a negative and one doesn't is because this one right here is a vector. That means that the resistive force is opposite the direction of the velocity. For some reason, the way they define this one as a vector and they don't define this one as a vector. I don't know why, that's just the way generally that those are um, written. The resistive force is always opposite, oh, sorry, always 99 point some odd percent of the time um, in the opposite direction of the velocity. I'm not gonna go through the other 